So in this video we're going to talk about the scientific method, the different steps of the scientific method, what each one involves, and we're going to focus on hypotheses and predictions and the differences between them. Now it's really important that we follow the scientific method and do rigorous scientific experiments because if we don't then we end up drawing conclusions that aren't correct. And in science, we take our findings and we, we go and do things with them. And so bad conclusions can have pretty catastrophic consequences. So let's go over the steps of the scientific method. The first thing is that we need to make an observation, something that we've observed and we've got questions about. For example, Maybe you go out and you put a plant pot on top of your lawn with some nice flowers in it and then move it when the flowers are done and you realise that the lawn has died underneath. So you've made that observation. And you're going to question that observation. So why did the grass die? So observation leads to a question. And that question needs to be something that we can test. It can't be something like, what's better, cats or dogs? We can't test things like that with science because it's very, very hard to collect the data. So when you're doing scientific experiments, start with a simple question. But after a question, you're going to do some research. And your research is going to lead to making a hypothesis and therefore a prediction. And you'll also research your methods as well, depending on the complexity of your experiment. In scientific research, methods are documented really well so that people can both repeat the experiment and go and use those methods for very similar experiments. Research about photosynthesis and how plants get their food and why they're green because you've noticed that when the plant died it went brown. So various things like that. All right, so you've done some research and the next thing you're going to do is you're going to make a hypothesis. Now the hypothesis is an educated guess, not just a guess but an educated guess, of the answer to your question. For example, plants require light to survive. So it's a very general statement, but it's also based on science. When you've made your hypothesis, you're then going to make a prediction. Now what your predictions are, are if the hypothesis is true, what results would you see in your experiment? It's not something like plants without light will die. Let's say you're making an experiment where you are going to cover up some plants and leave some exposed and see what happens. That prediction that I just said, that plants need light to grow, or plants covered up will die, that's just like another way of phrasing your hypothesis. So your prediction needs to be linked directly to your methods and your actual experiment, and it's what results you would see if your hypothesis is true. Your prediction in this case will be, I predict that if plants require light to survive, then the plants that are covered up will die. And even better, if you can link to the actual results you're going to measure, I predict that if plants require light to grow, then the plants that are not exposed to sunlight will grow significantly less than the plants exposed to sunlight, or will be brown after 10 days compared to the plants that are exposed to the sun. The prediction is linked directly to your experiment and directly to the actual data that you're going to collect. Your hypothesis is an educated guess of an answer to your experimental question. Okay, so you've made your prediction, you got your hypothesis, you've done your research, you think your methods are good, so go ahead and do your experiment. And in your experiment, you're going to collect some data. It's very, very important that you only test one variable at a time. It might seem like a great idea at first. Maybe you want to look at the impact of light and fertilizer on plant growth. It's actually a terrible idea to do that because let's say that in your experiment, you're going to test light and fertilizer. And so you cover up half of your plants with black cardboard so they can't get any light and you don't give them any fertilizer. And the other plants, you're going to expose them to light, and you're also going to give them fertilizer. And let's say the plants exposed to light and given fertilizer grow more. Well, how do you know whether it was the light or the fertilizer? You don't. So you have to test only one variable at a time. That's one of the most important things in scientific experiments. Now, at this point, you might find out that you actually need to modify your methods. And that's fine. Often we find that our methods 
aren't actually going to lead to us collecting the data that we want to collect. So you might need to change your methods and go back and do your experiment again to make sure you get the data that you actually want. Now you need to analyse your results. Analysing your results can be as simple as drawing a graph. Maybe you're going to draw a graph of some kind of measure of growth, so maybe height in the dark or in the light. And so the graph might look something like this. And this would be maybe average height of your 10 plants. You might find out the difference. All right, so let's say you've analysed your results and you've got what you think is the answer. You're now going to draw a conclusion based on your results. Let's say you've got a big difference between the height of plants grown in the dark versus the light. You may conclude that plants do need light to grow. Now, when you've drawn your conclusion, you need to compare your results with those of other studies. Did you find what was expected? You're also going to have to research the reasons for your results. What happens if plants are restricted with the amount of light they're given? Well, it's what they can't do photosynthesis, so they can't make sugars, and, and therefore they can't do their metabolic processes, and therefore they die. In your conclusion, which will be your discussion in your write-up, it's really important that you look at other studies. The very last step is to present your results. So you need to communicate your results to the rest of the scientific community. What you're going to do in 111 is you write a lab report. So let's just finish by really making sure we know the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction. Now the hypothesis is an educated guess, not just a guess, but an educated guess, of the answer to your question. Your prediction is the results of your actual experiment that you would see if your hypothesis is true. And your prediction is based on your actual experiment and your methods. It's linked to your methods. So let's say your experiment is to get 20 dogs and feed them randomly a bowl of kibble, either chicken or beef. And you're going to record the amount of time that it takes the dog to finish because you're assuming if the dog eats the food fastest, then it means it likes it more. So your prediction would be it takes dogs less time to finish 10 grams of chicken flavoured kibble than 10 grams of beef flavoured kibble. So your prediction is directly linked to the results of your experiment and the results that you would see if your hypothesis is true. Now what's the difference between the results and the conclusion or what's going to be the discussion in your lab report? Well the results are the data that you collected and any analyses that you did of that data. So this is going to include what we call the raw data, that's just the results straight from the experiment, means, so averages, what was the average time taken for the dogs to finish their chicken flavoured kibble versus the beef flavoured kibble. And then it's also a visual representation of your results and it's great if you can present your results visually. So graphs and tables. So your results section contains the raw data, any summaries or visual representations of your data. Your discussion section is what do you think the results actually mean? So, for example, we saw that on average dogs took significantly less time to eat chicken flavour kibble than beef flavour kibble. Therefore, we conclude that dogs prefer chicken flavour kibble over beef Maybe you didn't say any difference, and so you're going to conclude that dogs don't have a preference for flavour of kibble. Maybe the results are inconclusive, maybe there's a suggestion, but you need more experimentation to find out the actual answer. So you're going to state whether your results support or do not support your hypothesis. We say we accept or we reject our hypothesis. We don't talk about proving or disproving. The correct terminology is accept or not accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. And it's totally, completely fine to reject your hypothesis. It's exactly the same as accepting it. You found an answer to a question. It just turns out that the answer is different from what you originally thought it was. So never go back and change your predictions or your hypotheses based on your conclusions and your results. Because it's not about being right or wrong, it's about finding an answer. And you're, you're testing this experimental question because you didn't know the answer in the first place.
So never worry about your experiment being wrong because you didn't prove your hypothesis. State whether your findings are supported by other studies. Maybe Murray et al. found that dogs actually prefer beef flavoured kibble to chicken flavoured kibble. And you might want to talk about, well, why do you think you've got any differences in your results? So overall, the results are just simply the results of your study and not what you think they mean. And the discussion is actually discussing your results and what they mean, whether you supported, accepted or did not support or rejected your hypothesis. Did you predict correctly? Did you predict incorrectly? Either is fine. And then how does your study fit in with the general scientific literature?